When most people think of Al-Qadim, the first thing they think of are genies. And they're not wrong, the genies are probably the most iconic and important creatures of the setting. But what most people might not know is just how much more complex the genies are than they might seem at first. You do of course have the greater genies that everyone knows from the Monster Manual, the Dao, Marid, Jin, and Efrit. But there are several more types of genies in Al-Qadim. You have the Bajan, the Markeen, the Diminutive Jen, the Undead Ghouls, and of course the Tas genies, of which there are countless subtypes. In today's video I hope to go through the different kinds of genies that exist in Al-Qadim and their peculiarities, and even if you do not run an Al-Qadim game, I think you will find that some of the lore I present here will be useful for anyone hoping to use genies in their campaign. But before we take a look at these specific types of genies, let's talk a bit about what all genies have in common. Genies are a type of elemental humanoids. Most genies are formed from a single element, with the exception of being the Jan, who are formed from all four elements. In the land of Saqqara, genies might seem more common than anywhere else. This, is, this seems to largely be because the land is closer to the elemental plains than other regions, and a large amount of vortices to the elemental plains exist in Saqqara and allow for easier travel between the land and the inner plains. Some argue, however, that it's the other way around, that the borders of the elemental plains are so thin and the vortices are so many since there are so many genies in Saqqara. Regardless, the four greater genies are all natives of the elemental planes, although some have taken up permanent residence on the material plane. With the increased number of genies living in the land, you might think that Saqqarans would be used to seeing the elemental creatures wandering about. However, in most cases, Saqqarans are utterly terrified of genies. Genies are immensely powerful creatures, and are often physically imposing, some even tower above buildings. Even the weakest genie is so powerful that an average citizen of Saqqara would stand no chance against them, and genies are also known to be mercurial and unpredictable, so most people fear them, and because of that genies tend to try to stay hidden when moving around in mortal cities to try to avoid too much attention. One thing most genies have in common is a love of flattery. Most genies consider themselves better than mortals, and want mortals that address them to show proper respect. The safest way to address a genie is to appeal to their ego, while staying humble and formal. This is especially true when it comes to the merits. Genies in, t in turn tend to be extremely formal when addressing a mortal who is their master, although depending on the personality and the type of genie, or if the relationship between the master and servant is strained, the mortal may expect the genie to throw in a great deal of insults and bitterness while still staying very formal. Genies of all types are known to romance mortals as well, although such relationships are often short, passionate and difficult. Relationships with genies often come with rules or conditions that must be strictly adhered to by the mortal in question. These conditions can be anything, from banning the mortal to eat anything while visiting the elemental planes, to requiring the mortal to state a particular phrase each time it addresses the genie. Most mortals are also exceedingly jealous, which can cause all kinds of problems, especially if a genie already has other wives or husbands who might not appreciate having to compete with a mortal for their love's affections. Most relationships between genies and mortals end in tragedy for a mortal once the genie grows tired of them or they break one of the many obscure rules set down by their genie lover. Even though tales of genies romancing mortals are common in Saqqara, there are very few children born to such parents. It is not entirely known what is required for a mortal and a genie to have a child, but there are rumors that the mortal parent must be a powerful mage for a child to be conceived, or that other powerful magic and rituals must be performed to ensure a child, or that a powerful oath or bond must exist between the genie and the mortal. One thing is true for nearly all children of genies and mortals, however, and that is that they are not raised by their genie parents. When possible, the mortal parent will raise the child. The genie parent might provide occasional help with food, wealth, or protection, but generally will not take a hand in raising or teaching a child. Most often, the half-genie half child is hidden away in the material plane and knows little of its history. Now let's get down to some specifics. First, let's talk about the greater genies. The four greater genie types are the ones you will find in your monster manual. The Dao, the Jin, the Efrit, and the Marid. Those detailed in the Monster Manual are the common types of these genies. There are also genie nobles of each type. The nobility are much like their more common cousins, but they're generally even more powerful and dangerous. I'm not going to be talking too much about the greater genies, as these are the ones you probably know all about, and you can easily find information on them in the Monster Manual. But there are a few things about each genie race I would like to point out, amongst them their domains and their current rulers. 
The official title of a ruler of a DAO is the Great Khan of a DAO. The current Great Khan of a DAO is Kabril Ali al Sara al Salasil, the Fountain of Wealth, the Perfect Compass, Ataman of the Mountain's ro Roots, the Stone Sultan, Carver of Destiny, Master of Traders, Caravaneer of a Sevenfold Path, and Balancer of all earthly accounts. Unlike most Dao who are strong and muscular, Kabril is unusually fat and soft, but he has a quick wit and he prefers to rely on his mind over his body. He rules over a region of the Earth Elemental Plane known as the Dismal Delve. The Dao have a little interest in expanding their rule beyond the Delve, as long as they have ample riches to mine there. Dao live in maze works, which I would say is a mix between markets, palaces, workshops and mazes. There are many maze works throughout the Dismal Delve, but none greater than the Palace of a Great Khan, the Sevenfold Maze Work. A complex maze in seven stages is said that no one but the Great Khan himself has seen its center. The Dao have countless slaves and servants of all different kinds. Most of their slaves are races that are native to the elemental plane of Earth or who are known to live underground and are skilled miners or earth workers, such as dwarves or gnomes. But if there are a few that stand out, the Great Dismal Delve is policed by a small army of gargoyles called the Horns of the Earth or sometimes more informally, the Dark Wings. The guard goes in for the laws of a Dao and can in theory bring even Dao nobles in front of a judge. But should the judge find a Dao innocent of the crime, the Gargo will suffer the punishment instead. So for the most part, they only enforce the laws towards slaves and non-Dao commoners. The other group of slaves that stands out are the Minotaurs. Dao seem to have a particular fondness for Minotaur guards, perhaps not entirely surprising considering they live inside of mazes. Next we have a jinn, and the ruler, the great caliph of a jinn, Husam al-Balil ben Nafat al-Yagayim, master of the clouds and son of the breezes, ruler of all jinn, defender of the heavens, commander of the four winds, prince of birds, storm of the righteous, and master of the air. He is known as a competent ruler, although he is fickle and easily bored. Jinn are the physically weakest of the genies, and as such, the great caliph of a jinn and his nobles tend to have sizable entourages, and rely more on numbers than their other genie cousins. This has also led to Hassan preferring to win conflicts with his wits rather than his armed forces whenever possible, although he is known to be a strong fighter. The caliph himself is protected by the winds, a gentle breeze always surrounds him, and should anyone fire a ranged weapon against him, the winds will prevent it from reaching him. The Cleave rules over his people from a citadel of ice and steel, a huge oval block of elemental ice and earth that is in perpetual freefall through the elemental plane of air. The citadel is designed for use by flying creatures and without gravity in mind, and as such there is no real up or down inside of it. Corridors lead off in every direction, and all sides of rooms can be used. The citadel is surrounded at all times by several smaller palaces, clouds and rocks. These are the homes of important nobles visiting the Cleave. Then we have the Efrit. They are ruled by Sultan Marak al Sidan al Harik ben Lasan, Lord of the Flame, the Potent Incandescent, the Tempering and Eternal Flame of Truth, the Most Puissant of Hunters, Marshal of the Order of a Fiery Heart, the Smoldering Dictator, and the Crimson Firebrand. Marak has a small goatee, long claws, and is constantly surrounded by a shimmer of pale red fire and a hail of smoke. Those are known as the Sultan's Fire, and upon the death of a Sultan, the aura is transferred to their successor. Although one of the richest and most powerful beings in the plains, the Sultan has, a f has few indulgences, the exception being his prize-raising nightmares, Eversmoke and Black Onyx, whom he treats far better than any of his wives or children. The Sultan is a heavy gambler, and has at times almost bankrupted the Eferti state wagering on his nightmare races. The Sultan rules the Efreti from the Charcoal Palace that stands at the center of the Efreti capital, the City of Brass. The city is the greatest trade hub of the elemental plane of fire and one of the greatest hubs of the inner plains. The city floats above what you would call the land and seas of the elemental plane, carrying on a great shell of shining brass from where the city gets its name. I might just make a separate video someday talking about the City of Brass, it's a pretty unique place. Unlike the Dao, the Efreti are expansionists, and so constantly seek to subjugate more and more of the elemental plane of fire. They are in constant conflict with all the other races that inhabit the plane. They have also expanded to, onto the material plane. At the moment there are six realms that belong to the Efreti and that are on the material plane. And I would say it's not impossible that there may one day be more. Each domain on the material plane is ruled by a Pasha, who answers directly to the Sultan. 
Last, but absolutely not least, we have the Marids. They are ruled by a great Padishah of a Marid, Kalbari al Durat al Amwaj ibn Jari. Now, being the most powerful of all genies, she has hundreds of titles, but her most common ones are the Keeper of the Empire, the Pearl of the Sea, the Mother of Foam, the Maharaja of the Oceans, Emir of All Currents, Mistress of Rivers, Grand Raj of a Monsoon, General of Whales, Pasha of Corals, Savior of Fish, Marshal of Nets, and Patron of Water Spots. The actual appearance of the Padisha varies as she seems to be able to alter her form, but she is usually as beautiful as she is terrifying. She rules from a citadel of 10,000 pearls, a vast circular reef that floats in some of the warmer waters of the elemental plain. Funnily enough, the palace is occasionally occupied by a mortal water mage named Hatim al-Rakal and his army of sea monsters, pretending to be the Padisha and attempting to conquer the elemental plain. You see, the Marids are such backstabbers and intriguers that when the Padishah needs to travel, she forces her entire court to move with her, so no one will be left behind to potentially try to usurp her. But in doing so, the palace is left nearly empty, and Hatim moves in. Each time the Padishah returns, she easily sweeps him and his forces out, and banishes him from her realm. She seems honestly amused by his little attempts, as she could easily wipe him out of existence, but instead just gives him a slap on the fingers and sends him on his way. The Padishah generally does not acknowledge any marriage that isn't a noble, and as such, almost all marriages claim some form of nobility. Claiming to be a noble and being one is of course not the same thing. Just as with other genies, noble marriages are more powerful than their commoner cousins, although the differences in power are not as vast as with some of the other genies. So let's get to some of the more interesting stuff. The genies that aren't found in your regular old monster manual. Jan are considered the weakest of all the genies and are also the physically smallest, averaging a height around 6 or 7 feet, so about half the size of a normal genie or a third of the size of a Marid. Visually, there is very little difference between a Jan and a human, although a Jan is far stronger and are capable of conjuring food, enlarging themselves, turning invisible and ethereal a few times a day. Jan consists of all four elements, and as such aren't really at home in any of the elemental planes, and have to live out their lives on the material plane. They do possess the ability to sur survive on any of the elemental planes for up to 48 hours at a time, however, and can plane shift to the elemental planes, bringing up to six other creatures with them as they do. Jan do not trust humanoids, and live out in the desert, uh, as, live as desert nomads far away from civilization. Because of her genie heritage, they are capable of surviving in some of the harshest environments on the material plane, and so tend to live in some places that cannot support humanoid life. Jen get along well with the jinn, but tend to avoid their other genie cousins. And there are many jinn that ser Jan who serve in the armies of the jinn. Then we have the ghouls. Ghouls are a form of undead genies, specifically they are undead Jan. Ghouls are shapeshifters, and although they use their powers to appear as beautiful and seductive, their true forms are horrid. Ghouls have thick hair and bushy eyebrows that hang down over their eyes, their hands end in long jagged claws, and their jaws are muscular and jut out from their faces. Their skin is pale and clammy and cold, a sign of their undead nature, and they're usually taller than Jan, standing between 7 and 10 feet tall, although they're almost always hunched over. Ghouls have the feet and sometimes ears of a donkey. No matter what shape they have, they always keep their donkey feet, so ghouls prefer clothing that help keep their feet covered, such as long robes or dresses. Ghouls are very much aware of how ugly they are, and greatly value things that can make them less repulsive, things such as fine perfumes, cosmetics, clothes, jewelry, or the services of great barber. Ghouls are carrion eaters, and sustain themselves on eating dead humanoids. The jam that they kill are instead turned into ghouls. Some ghouls are skilled spellcasters, and some are even capable of becoming shairs, allowing them to summon and bind other genies. The next unique type of genie are the Marquis. Just like the Jan, the Marquis appear very similar to humans. Unlike the Jan, the Marquis live out their lives amongst the humans, most often blending into human society and pretending to be human themselves. The Marquis were banished and sent into exile to the material plane by the other genies. Who amongst the genies banished them, or what their crime was, has long since been forgotten, but it's believed that they were on the losing side of a genie rebellion and were forced to live out their lives as humans without most of their power. Marquis do in fact have the same lifespans as humans. What little, little power they have left uh, comes in the form of a few innate spell-like abilities. They may cast Flame Blade, Dust Devil, Invisibility, and Gust of Wind once per day. The most interesting and peculiar fact with the Marquis is a part of their curse. Each Marquis is identical in appearance to a human, born at the same time as a genie. I can definitely see some use for that in some adventures. 
Jinn are a specialized kind of familiar that are summoned by Shays. Many debate whether or not they're true genies or where they come from. Some believe that the Jinn are the children of genies, and although there's no proof of that, they certainly look like it, appearing like miniature versions of the greater genie types. Others believe that the Jinn are extensions of their master's souls. But the true nature of the gens are unknown. Gens can travel to the elemental planes freely and go there to fetch spells for the master. When they travel their home, they grow. They appear almost human-sized, but when they're forced into the plane opposite to their home, they shrink and appear as only a drop of water, a gust of wind, a dust ball, or a spark of fire. Gen personalities tend to be a mix of their genie type and the personalities of their master, and they're usually the most comfortable with masters whose personalities are already close to their native elements. Air elemental gens are called jinlings, and they are small air sprites, with blue tinted skin and white hair, and are capable of flight. They tend to be aloof and moralistic. Earth elemental gens are known as daolanin, they have tan skin and dark hair, and are twice as strong as other gens, for as much as that is worth. Fire elemental gens are called ifritikin, they have ebony skin and long flame haired hair. Ifritikin can produce flames at will, and are usually judgmental and malicious. The last gen type are the water elemental gen. They're called Maridans and have greenish skin and blue hair and eyes. Maridans are quick swimmers and can breathe underwater, and they're known to be capricious and playful. That brings us to our last type of genie, the task genies. A task genie is created when a genie is bound to perform a single task over and over for so long that their bodies eventually transform to better suit their work. If a task genie is prevented from performing their work, they eventually start to grow weak until they die. Task genies live for an exceptionally long time, but they do eventually die from old age. They also eat and drink as mortals do. Although generally less powerful than greater genies, task genies are unmatched in a particular area. They are master craftsmen able to perform fantastical feats. There are dozens of different kinds of task genies, such as artists, architects, miners, herdsmen, and winemakers. I'm not going to talk about every different type, even though I would like to. There are simply so many different kinds that we would be here all day. But it's safe to say that there is a task genie for most types of crafts, and whatever the task genie's role is, they're exceptional at it. Now the last thing I want to talk about is wishes. Not every genie can grant a wish, but those who can tend to have the same restrictions. There are a lot of people who tend to believe that you could wish for anything from a genie, but that's not entirely true. First off, a wish from a genie only works in the present. You cannot wish for something that has happened in the past to never have happened, although you can change the result of that event in the present. And a genie cannot guarantee the outcome of a future event, although it can give you the means to succeed at a later date. Genie wishes cannot change things that are abstract either, such as titles, authority, or rank. Think of how it worked in Aladdin. The genie couldn't actually make him a prince, instead it gave him everything he needed to appear to be a prince. Genie wishes cannot alter true emotions either, so you cannot wish for someone to love you. Genies can charm or confuse a creature for you, however, but they can only befuddle the mind of a single creature per wish. Genies cannot create permanent magical items with your wishes either. If you wish for a magical sword, they can give you one, but it has to already exist, so chances are your genie will steal it from somewhere. They can, however, create temporary magical items, such as potions or scrolls. Genie wishes are always one condition or action also, so you cannot simply string together the longest sentence ever and have it count as one wish. Genies don't punish those who do so, but only the first request is filled by the wish. Some creative wording may help you get more out of a wish. Wishing for all your enemies to be killed, for instance, would be a single wish. While if you listed the enemies you want killed, then each enemy slain would be a different wish. Although enemies is an abstract concept, so the wish may backfire anyway. Depending on the wish and the genie, the wish can be skewed and twisted. Many genies will explain what wishes can and cannot do, but a genie will often not know beforehand how a wish will turn out. Finally, a genie will always be the, take the easiest route possible to complete the wish. If you wish for gold, for instance, the genie will not create it out of thin air. It will transport gold from somewhere in the world to you, or if you're unlucky, it will transport you to, the, to a large cache of gold somewhere in the world, and those tend to be owned by someone. So when your player asks the genie to complete a task, simply ask yourself, what is the easiest way for the genie to do this? Because of this, wishes can often have consequences for those who call on them. So. Be careful what you wish for. 
That brings us to the end of this little exploration of the genies of al -Kadim. Hopefully you found it interesting, even though I left out a whole lot of basic information about genies found in the monster manual. If you liked my video, then why not leave a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more D&D content. If you want to support the channel, then share this video on social media or with friends, it really helps out a lot. And you can also check out my DMs Guild product page, or follow me on Tumblr or Twitter. Until next time, Dungeon Delvers.